Hi, my name's Aaron Curry, and in this video series, I'm talking to you about the chaos, the confusion, and the fear that's been caused by coronavirus, but the steps that you can put in place so you can help other people right now, today, and going forward financially, and how you can help you and your family to get a financial fortress that will help you and them for generations to come. In the first video in this series, I talked to you about what's happening in the marketplace right now. I gave you predictions from me and from other financial geniuses about what's going to be happening over the months and years ahead of us, both in the stock market, the property market, and any other investment. I also talked about how you can genuinely help other people who are going to be struggling. Who's going to be struggling? Why are they going to be struggling? I know that looks pretty obvious, but how you can go help them by mastering some very basic skill sets. It, you want to go watch that. The second video in, in this series, I talked about the 10 key areas that you need to master. If you want to be financially successful, you need to master these 10 key areas to an 8, 9 or 10 out of 10. And how when I went and interviewed 50 plus people that make £100,000 plus a year from property, they have mastered each of these 10 areas to an 8, 9 or 10. And I explain what they are so you can start to work out where your gaps are and what you need to master. In the third video in the series, I talked about the different property strategies that we have out there. So there are five core strategies that consistently make people £100,000 plus a year. And I share those strategies and I shared which of those strategies was best for you depending on what time you had available, what money you had available, and what experience that you had. So there's links around this video to all those three videos, and you can go watch those right now and get that information too. But in this particular video, what I want to talk to you about in this video are the golden rules, what I call my six C's, the golden rules to make sure you only ever buy world-class properties. If you're going to only ever buy seven, eight, nine, ten properties, you want them all to be world class. You don't want to buy seven, eight, nine average ones and find that you're making ten pound fifty a month. You want them to be world class investments that are going to feed you and your family for, as I say, generations to come. We don't know if coronavirus will reappear in five years' time. We don't know if a new virus will appear in five years' time. I want to help you get to a place where if that happens, you're fully free to go help others. You're fully free to give your time and effort to others because you financially are secure. And these six C's will help you to do that. Now, when I started out investing in property, when I first started out, you can start out and you can have job strategies, which I talk about in video three, or you can have investor strategies. And I jumped straight to being an investor. I was like, I'm gonna be an investor. I was like, in fact, I don't even need to go look at these properties. I can go buy a property at an auction. I don't even need to look at the thing. If it's good numbers, it's all about the numbers. If it's good numbers, I'll be okay. And the difference, by the way, between what I call a home buyer and an investor is this. A home buyer, most people have only ever bought residential properties. You may be the same. When you're buying a residential property, it's a heart decision. You're thinking with a heart. You want to build a nest. You want your family to be safe. It's a heart decision. Once you become an investor, it should be all about the numbers. What discount am I going to get on this property? What's the cash flow going to be? What's the capital growth going to be? And what's the demand? How many people want to stay in my property? It's all about the numbers. So having a financial background, I was a financial manager at Marks and Spencer's, I thought, and I did mortgages now. I thought, you know what? I'm an investor. I know about numbers. How, how hard can this be? So back then, the second property I bought for myself was a property in a town or an area of Leeds. It was in Leeds, city of Leeds, but it was an area called Chapel Town, okay? And this property was up for sale in an auction. And I thought, Do you know what? There'll be great deals at auctions. I'll get a discount at auction. So I'm going to buy from an auction. I didn't even go to the auction. I bid on the telephone for this property. That's how confident I was in my strategy. And in the auction, this house was up for sale. And it was like, guide price about £20,000. And the rental income was about £6,500 per annum. I was like, this is unbelievable. 30% return on investment. This, this is a no-brainer. 
this has got to work. And, and the house was actually split into two flats. Okay, they weren't really flats, but one person lived upstairs, one person lived downstairs. I was like, this is amazing. So I looked at the brochure, looked at some pictures they sent me. I, I, they, they sent me a copy of the tenancy agreement so I could see there was two tenants. This was amazing. So I bid at the auction and I got this property for, I can't remember if it was 21 or 22,000. Let's say it was 21. I think it maybe was 21,000. 21,000 pounds I spent and the income was gonna be 6,500 pounds a year. This is a dream. I wanted as many of these as I could get. So I bought this property in Chapel Town and I lived about 70 miles away back then. I was in Scarborough and um, I was like, this is amazing. Um, and then I wrote to the tenants. I said, look, I've taken over. I'm the landlord. Can you start paying me the rent? No rent came in. I contacted the landlords again, the, the tenants again. I was like uh, writing to them. I didn't have their phone numbers, of course, but I was writing saying, can you pay the rent? Still no rent comes in. So eventually it gets to one Sunday and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to drive over there. Now, I was busy in my job at the time, like many of you will be. So I'd made this investment decision, but I didn't have a lot of time because my job was going well. I was busy in the job. I'm like, this is a problem. I, I'm going to have to drive over there. So I drive over there and I actually had Adam, my son, in the car with me. And back then, he's, he's seven or eight years old. I can't remember his exact age, but Adam, my son's in the car. And I pull up outside this property that I've bought in Chapel Town, Leeds. And I turn and look at the house and there literally is bars, bars going that way, that way and that way on every window. The ho it's barred to stop people breaking in. They've barred every single window. The street's got all sorts of ruffians at the street corner at the top. There's another set of ruffians at the street corner at the bottom. I don't like the look of this place. And I'm now going, do I get Adam out of the car and take him with me? Do I leave him locked in the car? What the heck do I do with him? I eventually make the decision to leave him locked in the car. So he's locked in the car. I get out. I go to the front door. And I'm knocking on the front door. I do have a set of keys, but I'm knocking on the front door. No one's answering. I'm ringing the bell that's broken for number one, the bell that's broken for number two. And eventually I go in. And what I find is the ground floor is totally empty. The carpets have been taken. They've disappeared probably long ago. And this is supposedly a rented property that I've got a tenant in. And there's some kind of drug-type paraphernalia kicking around. Look, It looks like that. I don't even know what drugs are. I'm 26, 27 years old. I don't know what drug, but it looks like bad stuff. And I make my way upstairs. And I'm shouting, hello, hello, hello. And somebody kind of, I hear this voice shout back. I get upstairs and I walk into what is their lounge area, small area. And there are six big guys sat around, but they are so chilled it is unbelievable. I'm like, hi, hi, who's the tenant? And it, it takes me about three minutes to get out of them. Yeah, man, that's me. That's me. And I'm like, great, great. So, so you must be Richard, right? Richard, I, I just need you to tell Housing Benefit to pay the rent to me. You know, I'm the new landlord. Can you do that? I just need you to go to Housing Benefit and tell them I'm the landlord. He's like, yeah, man. Tomorrow, man, yeah. And I'm like, this isn't going in. This guy's not, I'm doing all I can. And part of me's terrified because I've never been around drugs. That they're, they're stoned. So knowing what I know now, and I've still not been around drugs, but these guys are chilled. They're not going to attack me. But I don't know that. There's drug stuff everywhere. There's six big guys, and I'm trying to get him to pay me the rent. So he's like, yeah, man, I'll sort it tomorrow. I'm like, this is never going to happen. I go back downstairs, and all this time I'm nervous as heck for Adam outside. Um, and I go into the back garden of the property, or the back yard, and the back wall is, is really, really high, 10 foot high, and has barbed wire across the top of it. I'm like... This is this is a horrendous place. So I, I leave. I leave as quick as I can. I've, I've hopefully got this person to start paying me rent, which he, of course, doesn't do. He never gets down to the housing benefit to tell them to pay me. All he had to do was tell them. Um, and I ring up a builder. I'm like, the downstairs is derelict. It's got some stuff around. I need you to go sort it out. So the builder goes down a few days later, and he calls me. He says, Aaron, I'm not working there. He said, it's Beirut, if I park my van there, someone's going to steal the van. And that downstairs, it's full of needles. It's full of needles. I, I can't send my team in there. They are needles. People, I'll get infected. Well, they'll get infected. So I'm sat in Scarborough. I've bought this so-called so amazing 30% ROI property, and it's derelict. Downstairs, upstairs is not paying me. Downstairs is empty, and no builder will work on it. And 
I'm, I'm stuck. I'm, I'm clueless what to do. It's costing me money every month. Luckily, my job's working well and I can afford to pay for it. And, you know, and, and by the way, this is one horror story. I can tell you some others if we have more time. What then happens is unbelievable. About two, three weeks later, I still don't know what to do. I'm, I'm wondering whether I need to send a gang down of big people to remove the top ten. I, I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't know again. Um, and then I get a phone call. And the phone call's in the middle of the night. It's like Sunday morning, 2 a.m. And I answer the phone all groggy. And it, they say, it's the fire brigade in Leeds. And I'm like, okay. And I'm, I'm trying to connect with Leeds in my head. You know, and they're like, we're at your property um, uh, in Chapel Town. They've had a big drugs party and they've set it on fire. And your property has more or less burnt down. I'm like, wow. I'm like, what do you want me to do? I, I, I can't drive there and put it, they're like, don't worry, we put the fire out, uh, you know, it's more or less out, but your property's burnt down. Uh, this is where you are. And I'm like, clueless. I'm absolutely clueless. I don't know what to do. Uh, this is a disaster. This was meant to be a great investment. And I don't know what to do next. Now, I'm going to cut a long story short for you right now. What I ended up doing was putting the property back up for sale. I didn't even know what to do with it. I, I never wanted to go there again. And I never actually went there again. This is how ridiculous this story is. I never even went again. I got some photos of it being burnt down, but I never went again. I just thought, put it back in the auction. Even if they sell it for three grand, I might have lost 18, 20 grand, but I'm out of this. I just put it up for sale, get rid of it. So I put it back up for auction. By total chance, this is not my expertise, the property market had gone up in value. The insurance company pay me out £6,000 for damages to the property, which is nowhere near what the damages were, but they pay me out £6,000. And the property sells in auction for £20,000. I bought it for 21 or 22 It sells for 20 and I get six for the insurance company. I end up with £26,000 back, and I got rid of my troublesome tenants, and I got rid of my house. Absolute madness. So I actually made a profit. Okay, do not go do that. That is not my teaching. That is not how to make a profit in property. My point is, you need to know what you're doing. If you're going to be an investor, you need to know what you're doing. If you pick a job strategy, you need to know what you're doing. You've got to buy the right houses. That was never, ever, ever the right house. So what I want to teach you now is what I call my six C's. My six C's are the golden rules to make sure you only ever buy world-class investment properties. And it took me till I bought... 40 or 50 of these. Now, don't get me wrong, after my first 10, I committed to mastery. I started learning from experts and getting myself in the right place. And, you know, my number 10 to 50, I was doing all right. You know, by property 17, we were able to be financially free if we wanted to. We didn't know we need to work if we wanted to, etc. But I was still making mistakes. I was still buying the wrong houses or they weren't performing anywhere near as they should. And it wasn't one until I sat down and studied this in detail and really studied it, that I came up with my six C's. And every house I've bought since, I've got over 200 in my portfolio, helped our clients to buy over 1,000, has to meet these rules. If it fails just one rule, it gets rejected. So what are the rules I hear you shouting? Well, here's rule number one, capacity. C for capacity, okay? What do I mean by that? If you're buying, these are the rules, by the way, for family-let properties. In video three, I taught you a number of different strategies Okay, and I chose you to choose one. If your strategy isn't family let, you need to go find out these rules, learn these rules from a master. I can teach you them, but I'm not doing it on this video. But learn the rules to make sure you buy world class properties in that strategy. I'm covering right now family lets. So if we go for C for capacity, what do I mean by that? If you're going to get a family let off the nose of buy to let, you need it to be a three or a four bedroom house, not a flat, not an apartment, not a two bed. People say, why not? You get a one-bedroom flat, somebody moves in it, then they fall in love with someone in that one-bedroom flat, they move out and move in with them, okay? That's now a problem for you. You've got an empty property again. You get a two-bedroom house, somebody moves in with one child, they get pregnant, they now are having another child, they need a three-bedroom house, they move out. And you end up with what I call transiency and transient properties. On average, a tenant change costs you £1,500. That's £1,500 each time the tenant changes. If you lose the tenant once a year, over 10 years, that's a £15,000 problem. If you've got 10 of those properties, that's a £150,000 problem you've now created for yourself. Okay? All because you bought the wrong houses. If you buy the right three and four bedroom houses that meet the rest of my rules in a moment as well, 
And you get someone who says, do you know what? I want to live here forever. My mum lives down the road. My, my uncle, my auntie live up the road. My kids are at the local school. I want to live here forever. You get what I call a lifer. They may not stay forever, but they're going to stay long term. When the door handle breaks, a lifer fixes the door handle. Yeah? When the property needs painting, a lifer rings up and says, can I paint it? You buy them the paint. They paint it. They decorate it. They stay for life. You don't get that transiency. At the Insight Group, our average tenancy is over five years because we buy the right houses. Okay, so we're not paying that £1,500 each year. It's every five years or more. And they've done the repairs along the way, so we've saved money along the way as well. So you need to make sure you're buying three and four bedroom houses. What's the second C? The second C is C for city. What do I mean by city? Well, let me give you an example. And I'm going to give you a Yorkshire-based example. I used to live in Yorkshire. I'm in Wilmslow now, uh, shooting this in Wilmslow in Cheshire. But, but I used to live in Yorkshire. And when I went out my front door, if I drove about 30 miles, I'd arrive in York. And whether you know York or not, you'll know it's a picturesque place, a cathedral and all that stuff. In York, for £150,000, you'll buy a three-bedroom house, and it will rent for about £700 a month-ish. Okay? Three-bedroom house. If I went out my front door and went in another direction into Scarborough, North Yorkshire, with my £150,000 uh, money, I could buy two houses for 75000 each. So I've spent the same amount of money, but I've got two properties now. Three bedroom houses. And they rented out for five sixty a month. So now I'm on eleven twenty a month income from my two properties, whereas in York I'm on £700 a month from my property. Now, I know over time that properties go up the same. If York goes up 7% this year, next year Scarborough's going to go up 6 to 8%. If York goes down 2% this year, next year Scarborough will go down 1% to 3%. But over time, they go up the same. So if over time my investments are going to go up the same, I know what I'd rather have in the meantime. I'd rather have the 1120 of rent rather than the 700 of rent. I'm making an extra 420 a month which is an extra £5,000 a year while I wait for it to go up. Now, by the way, I'm not telling you to buy properties in Scarborough. There are often, out of the 400 or so we'll buy for our clients this year alone, probably only 5 or 10 will be in Scarborough. There's even better places often to buy. The point I'm making is don't buy just because it's local. Buy for the best return on investment. Get the best town and city that's going to get you the best financial return and wrap that with an expert team that looks after it so it's a true investment so you don't have the job of looking after it so we've got a three or four bedroom house and we're buying it in the right town or city what are the next two c's the next two are c for capital and c for cash flow we want capital growth at the table and we want cash flow at the table you need both over time here is what happens early 2000s in the uk House prices are going up, okay? House, let's, let's say we're in London. House prices are going up. We get to about 2007, 2008. While these house prices are going up, by the way, rents are still going up, but they're going up more slowly. 2007, 8, people say, it's too expensive to buy, I'm going to rent. So the house prices slow or even drop a bit, and the rents start going up really, really fast. We get to about 2012, people go, this is crazy. It's more expensive to rent than to buy. So the housing market starts slowing, um, in terms of rental increases, they're still increasing but slower, and the house price starts booming again, 2012. We get to about 2020, before coronavirus, the London market starts slowing, still going up, but people going, it's more expensive to buy than rent, I'm going to rent, and the rents have started rising, okay? The point I want you to get is over time, they're both going up, they're not crashing back down, they're both going up. As an investor, I don't care what's happening today. I care that long-term assets go up in value. That's important. But in time, I've either got my asset going up in value, I can refinance it, draw money out and buy more or, or use it to have a fun time. But when the market's not going up in value, like at the moment with coronavirus, it's going it's to go down a bit, the rents are going up. Supply and demand, they have to either be buying or they're renting, so I make more cash flow profit. Either way, in every economy around the world, at all times, one or the other is going up. As an investor, I win either way. So if I'm in it for the long term, I know both are going to go up and I win either way in the meantime. So that's the beauty of this. So how do you make sure you get great capital growth? 
on average in the UK for the last 85 years, the property market has gone up on average at 7.9% per year. That's on average. That includes all the downturns, the drops, the falls, as well as the up periods. So if we can get national average, we're in an amazing place. So let's imagine we can't get national average. Let's imagine a model, if you're going to model, model more cautiously, model at 4% or 5% to be cautious, okay? But we want to get the national average. How do you get the national average for capital growth? Five core steps. Step one, you buy in a town or a city. Minimum population, 80,000 people, okay? If you buy in a village and the local factory shuts down and 100 people lose their job, microeconomics kicks in, property market's not changing for the next 10 years, your money's stuck. So you want to buy in a town or a city, minimum population, 80,000. Number two, buy within five miles of the town or city centre. You can measure that by the town hall, the train station, I don't mind, okay? If it's Manchester, Birmingham or London, it's within seven miles, but otherwise it's within five miles always. Number three, buy within two miles of a good or outstanding secondary school. So look at the Ofsted reports, it needs to be good or outstanding, you're within two miles and you're in the catchment area. Number three, good public transport network. You know, in most towns or cities you've got that, bus, trams, trains, whatever it is, but you need to be within striking distance. Don't be the other side of the estate where it's three quarters of a mile walk. Be within striking distance, good public transport network, and finally, good road network, which towns and cities have. If you meet those five rules, I can almost guarantee you, you'll get the national average as a minimum in terms of growth. And that national average isn't going to be great in the next three, six months. But if you learn the skill sets, I covered this in video one, so that you start buying in three or six months time, you're going to be buying at the right price point. Then you're going to see the assets go up and you're going to get great cash flow in the meantime. You might not get great cash flow in the next three months while we're all isolated, but once we're up and running again, great cash flow, great asset growth, okay? So that's how you get great capital growth. How do you get great cash flow? Very, very simple formula for you. When you're purchasing a property, let's say you're buying it for £100,000, you want the yield to be at least 7.2%. That means if you're buying it for £100,000, you want the rent to be at least £7,200 per year, which is £600 a month. That's 7.2% of 100K at least £600 a month. If it's less rent than that for a £100,000 purchase, you run a mile. If it's that rent or more, you're happy to buy it. And then you do that pro rata. If it's a 200k property, it needs to be at least £1,200, etc. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing you need to consider. That's a very, very simple way of checking that out. If you want to check it out in a slightly more complex way, which is still really simple, You can take the rent that is coming in. So let's say the rent is $650 a month. You knock off the mortgage. You knock off the maintenance cost. You knock off the insurance cost. So in this example, let's say the mortgage was $300. The maintenance cost was £80 a month. And the insurance was $20. So I've got £400 of cost going out in total. $650 coming in, $400 going out. Okay? I've got $250 left. I've got to pay for my letting agent. My letting agent might be £70 a month. Let's say £80 a month. So if I take them off as well, I'm left with £170 a month. That doesn't sound like a lot, £170 a month, okay? But I'm going to be cautious with my mortgage rates. I'm going to be cautious with my refurbishment budget, cautious with my insurance. So that property might be making me about £300 a month, but I've modelled it cautiously, okay? And I'm covering it quickly now. I'll give you a lot more detail later on in this series. So if that property is making me £170 a month, and it was rented for 11 months of the year, let's say. At the end of the year, I'm going to have something like £1,800 in a bank. 17, 18, £1,900. If the property is empty in the 12th month, I've got enough money there to cover the rent for the 12th month. The 650 rent is covered by the profit I've made in the first 11. If you make sure every property you have meets that rule, so that the cash flow it generates being cautious times 11 is enough to cover month 12, I never have to put money in this deal again. Once I've bought the asset, it never costs me another penny ever again. How many of those assets would you like? Each month you pull the handle and cash comes out. It never costs you another penny again. You'd like as many as you can get. 
and then I'll teach you how to, once you've bought the house, get your money back out again to buy more with or go spend on a holiday and have fun with. Now you've got an asset that costs you nothing. Ultimately, you've got your money back out and it makes you money every day for the rest of your life. This is what professional property investors do. This is what you can do if you follow these rules. Let's look at the fifth C. The fifth C is C for check. Most professional investors I know don't follow this C and they still make mistakes. The C for check means before you buy the house, check it will rent first. Check there's a demand for it. You run an advert on Zoopla, on, you know, in, the, in the local paper, to advertise the property you're thinking of buying. Of course, you can't show pictures of the very house because you don't own it yet. But you say, look, three-bedroom property, Nelson Street, double glaze, gas central heating, £650 a month. And you're checking how many phone calls you make. It's a numbers game. If within that first week you get 10 or more phone calls, people interested, you're going to go ahead and buy, as long as it meets all the other rules. If you get less than 10 phone calls, even if it's only nine, you might have the perfect three-bedroom house in the right city, right cash flow, right capital growth, but you only get nine calls. You're walking away. You're deselecting this property. It has to meet every single C fully or you don't buy because there'll be another house on the next town, the next street that meets all the rules plus this one. So if you get just nine calls, you're walking away. Here's what used to happen when I first bought properties. I used to buy a house. Five people would call me interested. Three people would view it. One person would want it. And I used to celebrate. I'd be like, I've got a tenant. In reality, they were the only human being out of seven billion on the planet that wanted my miserable house. That's how rubbish my house was. Whereas if you run an advert and 20 people are interested and 10 people view it and five people want it, same ratios, five people want it, now you can ask for bank statements, references, guarantors, the works. If that puts one or two of them off, fine, there's still three or four that want it. Now you're choosing the tenant, they are not choosing you. If that tenant then stops paying the rent or starts trashing your property, you'll deal with them ethically, but if they don't get caught up, you'll get them out. And you'll be totally confident you can relet it. In my early days, I was scared to get them out. They weren't paying me, they were trashing my property, but I knew if I got them out, I might not get another one. So I stuck with the devil I knew instead of changing it. You've got to, got to have good demand for your property, otherwise you should never buy it. Never buy it. Final piece, the sixth C contingency. Do not invest in property and put every single penny you've got in the deal and leave yourself with nothing left. What if the boiler breaks? What if there's a problem? So in family-let properties, whatever you're going to invest, keep 4.5% of it as a protection buffer. So if you're going to invest £100,000, you put 95500 down and 4500 stays in your rainy day bank account to protect the investment. If you're going to invest £50,000, it's still 4.5%. So 47,750 um, gets invested and 2,250 gets put in the rainy day bank account. You keep four and a half, if it's a million, you keep 45,500 to one side and you put the other 955,000 in. You make sure you're keeping four and a half percent to one side to protect your investment. Then you've got your investment up and running. It's making you cash flow profit every month on top. Let's say you've got three, giving you 200 pound a month each. It's going up 600 pounds a month every month. Eventually, if a boiler breaks, you've got plenty there to pay for it. And this pot gets bigger and bigger, and then you can buy some more properties. And the properties go up in value, and you can release money from them, and you can buy some more properties. And then you get number four. You haven't put any of your own money in now. But those three have paid for the fourth. Then the four go up in value, and they make you all profit. And even faster, you get number five. And they go up, and even faster, you get number six, because you bought the right rules. Because you bought the right rules. So these six C's are absolutely business critical. These six C's at the Insight Group, when we're investing, we will look at properties that come in with a 15% genuine market discount. And most investors would jump at that. Great, they've got a discount. Because of the other C's, we reject 59 out of 60 of those properties that other people would buy. We say, no, not good enough. And that's how rigorous I want you to be. Now, does this take some effort? Yeah. Does this take some time? Yeah. But you're only going to buy eight, nine, ten of these babies. So you may as well buy the best ones and get them in your portfolio. And if you learn these skills over the next two, three months, so you lock this stuff down and get this stuff in your locker, then when 
when the market is there that people need your help, they need to sell, the builders need to sell, the people getting divorced or splitting up need to sell, the people with finance, when they need your help, you'll have the skill set to help them and to build that financial fortress for yourself. So we've been covering this video, the six C's, the golden rules to make sure you only ever buy diamond properties. What I'd like to do is invite you to join me on some online training I'm going to be running this coming Wednesday night. Okay, so webinar, online training, me live in person, but doing a deeper dive on all of this stuff. On that online training, I'm going to teach you these 10 key areas in far more detail. Okay, in fact, I'm going to give you a print off. You're going to print off in advance of that training. It's like coming to school. Okay, but a good school, a school that's going to make you money, not just teach you to be one of everybody. You're going to come, come with that thing and you're going to score yourself out of 10 on each one. And I'm going to really teach you it in detail so you can identify your gaps. You can identify what you need to learn to really master this. Okay. I'm going to teach you how you do with just seven, eight or nine properties. I'm going to show you the numbers, show you the slides, show you the numbers. Seven, eight, nine properties, you can be on £50,000 a year. How the heck does that work? I'm going to show you exactly how the professionals take their profits from property and how you can too. I'm going to teach you what's called my joint venture triad. Okay, How you need money at the table, time at the table and experience. And I'm going to teach you how you can help those people right now who are struggling. They may be friends and family. They may be people you've never met yet. But they're struggling right now because they were relying on living off the interest on their savings. And their savings are shot. Or they were relying on the stock market and it's crashed 30% and it's shot. I'm going to teach you how you can get those people earning more money. You can help them earn more money. You can help the people that need to sell their houses. And you can make money in the middle of that. And most importantly, build a financial fortress for you now and for your future. So the next time something like this happens, the next time there's a virus around the corner, the next time, you know, let's hope it's not coronavirus, let's hope there's never a virus. But the next time there's a problem, you're safe. You're financially safe. And you can put all your attention into loving and caring for those in your family and loving and caring for your community and other people that need you because you don't need to worry about money. Because right now, most people are having to worry about everybody else, but also worry and stress and panic about money too. And you may be in that exact same camp. And I need you not to be there if this ever happens again. You need that fortress in play. And when, when in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, you're retired and the government is still skint, because they're putting all this money in now, we're going to be paying this money back for generations to come when they're still skin and they can't afford to pay big pensions even though they'd like to. And they can't afford to support you in that way in your retirement. It doesn't matter to you because you and your children and your children's children have got this legacy. You're going to be financially safe. So right now, down at the bottom here, you can put in your name and email and you can register to join me for free. It's totally free on my online training on the webinar this, this Wednesday night. Come and join me for free. Put your details in down below. And I'm going to teach you those 10 key areas. I'm going to teach you that joint venture triad. I'm going to teach you how to raise money from other people so you help them, you help you. I'm going to teach you how to find other people that need your help and, and to find great property deals and lots, lots more. Uh, and, and most importantly, how to leverage your money up. So you might think, I need a load of money to do this. You don't need anywhere near as much as you think. I'm going to show you how you can get started and how you can make this happen for you. I really hope you've enjoyed this video series uh, and I want, want to see you on that webinar so I can help you take these next steps. Okay, There's lots more, loads more still to teach you. Invest with knowledge, invest with confidence, create financial freedom. I'll speak to you soon. Thank you.